Hi, everyone. Welcome to Your Money Map, sponsored by the Alliance for Lifetime Income. I'm your host, Jean Chatsky, and today we are going to dig into Medicare. If you are enrolled in Medicare or you plan to be soon, well, you know just how complicated it can be. You know that selecting a plan to fit your needs can be enough to make your head spin. And this is the time of year where we want to talk about it. Medicare open enrollment time, which goes until December, is, is the point in the year where if you want to make a change or if you're having to choose for the first time, your options are open to you. But it's important to gather all of the information as you dig into them. As always, this is a forum for your questions in addition to mine. So let us know where you are, whether you're coming in from Facebook or coming in from LinkedIn. Put your questions in the comment section. It'll be my pleasure to pull them out and integrate them into the conversation. And what a conversation we are going to have. I have two guests to help me parse through Medicare today. Let me tell you a little bit about them and then I will bring them in. So Larry Kotlikoff is with us. He's been here before. He's a professor of economics at Boston University, also a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. And he is president of a company called Economic Security Planning, which specializes in financial planning software programs, some of which you may have heard of, including including MaximizeMySocialSecurity.com and AnalyzeMyDivorceSettlement.com. These are programs that can help you figure out if you're getting a good deal. He's also a New York Times bestselling author. And The Economist magazine ranked him as one of the world's 25 most influential economists. We've also got Phil Muller with us. Phil is the author of the Get What's Yours series of consumer guides. You may have heard of them. Get What's Yours for Healthcare. Get What's Yours for Medicare and Get What's Yours, The Secrets to Maxing Out Your Social Security, which he co-wrote with Larry Kotlikoff and Paul Solman. Uh, a revised edition of his Medicare book will be coming out next year. He's also an experienced journalist who has written for pretty much every personal finance publication on the planet. Um, he's created award-winning content for many, many decades. Um, let me say hello to both of these guys. Welcome them to the show. Hi, Larry. Thank you so much for joining Great. us. Hey, Great. Bill. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. We're going to play a little musical chairs and make sure you guys are by the right name tags. So let me just, let me start with you, Larry, with a question about why Medicare is so confusing. I, I have talked to consumers about this through the years, and, and I know it makes people's heads spin. Well, I, I think, you know, traditionally, I think it started in 65, Johnson implemented the program. And then over time, it was becoming very expensive. The Republicans wanted to have their version, which was, which permitted competition, and uh, and then the, you know, when you, when you have competition in a homogeneous product like apples, it works great because then people get to buy, the you know the best apple for the lowest price, but when you have uh, something like healthcare, where each uh, provider can provide a different set of services or they could be really good here in this particular area, but not so good, let's say with diabetes, but they're very good with arthritis. And then you get diabetes having had arthritis, and now you need to switch. Uh, the insurance, these uh, private insurance companies have a history uh, going back to the reason Medicare was initiated of, of cherry picking. The reason Medi we didn't have any health insurance really available for the elderly before Medicare was put into place is that the insurance companies would look for the good risks and leave the, uh, the people with the diabetes uninsured. And then the whole thing kind of unraveled. So nobody was, in, was getting coverage basically uh, because the price for, for coverage was super high and uh, Medicare. And then we had uh, all this competition and still the desire to cherry pick. So one thing is that competition where you force everybody to 
provide a really homogeneous service, cover the same things uh, at the same cost, and then let them compete on quality. It's another to have a free for all, and the Republicans uh, chose to go for the free for all. Well, it it, it may have started out um, as trying to be a you know, one bucket of coverage. But I think through the years, what has happened is that we've got a lot of different parts to this coverage and a lot of different types of insurance that actually fall under the heading of Medicare and its offshoots. And that makes it more difficult to understand. Phil, can I ask you for sort of a a, a breakdown as we go through the different kinds of coverage? Let's just explain to people what they are, how they work, and what purpose they serve. I'm not going to go through A, B, C, and D yet. I actually want to go through the bigger buckets first. When we talk about traditional Medicare, what is that? Phil, can you hear me? <laughs> we can, oh, we, we can. can't hear you. Are you muted? Yeah. Um, no, we can't hear you. Larry, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this question and let me ask my team maybe to try to troubleshoot with Phil behind the scenes sure. um, in the private chat. So when we talk about traditional Medicare, Larry, what, what are we talking about? So we're talking about um, part A, which uh, we have to go through the ABs and Cs, unfortunately. So it's a uh, hospital coverage, which is uh, covered 100 uh, percent. And then you have Part B, which is uh, outpatient services, and only 80% of that is covered. So then you need a supplemental uh, plan. Hold Medigap the supplemental plan for a second. Let's yep. let's just talk about what's in traditional Medicare. Well, they're going to cover hospitalization and outpatient services up to a limit uh, in terms of the costs, and uh, and they won't cover drugs. Uh, so. They won't cover vision. They won't cover dental. So it's a limited set of services that they cover. And this is why these are part, you know, the Advantage plan, which is the alternative to traditional Medicare, uh, has some advantages. That's why it's called the Advantage plan. Yeah. Phil, can you hear me now? And can I hear you? I think that that you're muted. If you can kick the the click the microphone on your image, it should be on the top right corner or at the bar on the bottom of the screen. Yeah. I'll just How, how's that? There we go. We got you. All right. So so that's traditional Medicare. It's it's basically insurance for people 65 or older who are not covered by an employer. What is Medicare Advantage? I'm sorry you're breaking up. I'm so sorry, Jean. Okay. The only fix right. I can figure out is to have um, your chat person send me your question, but that's not reasonable. No, so. that's okay. We're going to say I, goodbye I, I, and Larry and I will continue the conversation. Thank you so much yeah, for trying to be I'm here sorry. today with us. That's okay. Okay, Larry, let's, let's, uh, so, so we explained traditional Medicare. Yeah. What is Medicare Advantage? Yeah. Uh, so Medicare Advantage is for those uh, who are eligible for Medicare uh, and, and yeah, you're right. It's people 65 and older who are healthy, but then if you're disabled, you can uh, be covered by Medicare if you're getting disability benefits from Social Security. Uh, so uh, the alternative here is Medicare Advantage. It's also called Medicare Part C because traditional Medicare consists of, comprises Part A, Part B, and Part D. Uh, and the, um, so Part C, uh, Medicare Advantage, allows you to choose an HMO uh, or a similar healthcare provider uh, that's going to give you uh, the coverages that are dictated or mandated by uh, the government, minimum coverages, but they may go beyond that. And they may include vision and dental. They may include, they generally will include drug benefits, which are not included in traditional Medicare. 
and uh, but they're uh, limited to in network in terms of your full coverage. Uh, uh, if you go out of network, you're going to be facing extra costs, and even in in network, there may be co-pays and co-insurance uh, and deductibles. So one has to be very careful uh, what one's signing up for. One needs to make sure that what you've got is actually covered, what you might get is actually covered, the drugs you need are covered, uh, and uh, and you need to understand the cost for everything. Uh, and you might un you need to realize that there's lots of risk here that you could be young and not have any of these needs, but that 10 years from now, uh, you will, you may, and uh, in that case, uh, things could get very expensive. You may want to switch back to traditional Medicare but then there's issues with that as well. There's risks with that. Well, the, and and traditional Medicare with a Medicare supplement plan is not always possible to get, correct? So explain a Medicare supplement plan, also called Medigap insurance. Well, I want to say that you can always switch, uh, either take Medi traditional Medicare to begin with or switch uh, to it under in the open enrollment period, which is October 15th through December 7th. But um, uh, as I indicated, uh, the Medicare Part A, the hospitalization 100% covered. Part B, the, you know, seeing your doctor or getting treatments in your doctor's office, uh, only 80% of the costs are covered. Uh, so, and then with drug benefits, you're gonna have to drive, purchase a drug plan and there's, there's limitations, there's co-payments and deductibles and co-insurance on these. Uh, so you need a supplemental policy really to help, help cover these extra costs. And the risk um, when you go from Medicare Advantage, just flipping back to traditional Medicare, is that you now need to buy a supplemental policy, but that supplemental, that, that company that's selling you the policy can experience rate you, can say, oh, your experience is that you got med you have di diabetes, and now we're going to charge you more than had you joined our plan when you first could, back in, at right. age sixty five. That's well, that's wrinkle. that's sort of the wrinkle, as I understand it. That yeah. if you think you're going to want Medicare plus a Medigap policy or a Medicare supplement policy, yeah. you want to get that right at age sixty five, and you probably want to stick with it. Because if you don't stick with it, then the insurer can base the amount that they're charging you on your health. They can underwrite you based on your health or experience rate you, as, as you said. Um, and, and that can get very expensive. They can also, I believe, refuse to cover you. Yeah, I, I, I think they can. And I think um, I'm not positive about that. But uh, the other thing is I believe that they can change what they do cover or, or they can pay change their co-pays and their deductibles and their co-insurance rates. So the, so the supplemental plan that you chose that looked terrific at age 65 can over time become super expensive. And there's another one over here that would that would have been better to have chosen initially, but now it's also super expensive because you have pre-existing conditions. The same thing with the, the Part D drug benefits. It's really, so traditional Medicare is not safe either. Uh, yeah. So what's the playbook? I'm turning 65. I need coverage. I'm not actually turning 65 for a few You're years, but let's just say, 40, let's 40, just 40. say I'm turning 65. I need coverage. Yeah. How do I decide which is better for me if I want Medicare Advantage or if I want traditional Medicare with a Medigap plan? Well, I think there are a lot of factors. I mean, some people have pre-existing conditions and they uh, uh, and they know their longevity is uh, pretty you know pretty short uh, and they can find a, a terrific um, advantage plan like Kaiser Permanente uh, seems to be quite good and they they can trust it uh, to be there for them and they and it may be quite you know cheaper than what they would be facing buying the supplemental, the Medigap plan, and the Part D plan separately. So that might be the best move for them. So you really have to do your homework. It's There are many, many Medicare Advantage plans, and then there's traditional. So you really have to you know, go to school on this. Uh, 
And what's the best way to go to school? Janet is asking, Janet Connolly from our, our crowd here is asking, is it a good idea to go through a broker? And how does she know that the broker is giving her the best plan? You know, then I would say there's a risk there. And, you know, the, econ the economist in me says you want to diversify. So go to three brokers uh, and also, also ask everybody, you know, um, that you're, you know, that's on Medicare Advantage uh, or traditional Medicare, what their experience has been, especially older people, people in their 80s. Uh, they have a lot to, to teach us about these uh, choices. So it's... Um, and then you also have to think about self-insuring, about the fact that no matter what you do, there's risks. And uh, you know, one way we can insure is by self-insuring, saving more for the eventuality that we're going to need more money. We can also think about buying health healthcare outside of the country. Uh, I understand that dentistry is very good and very inexpensive in Taiwan. Uh, uh, cosmetic surgery is apparently quite. I mean, cosmetic surgery is not covered by any of these things. But if you wanted that, I think it's cheap in India. But you know, who knows if there's complications? So, uh, but that's not, you know. The concept of self-insuring is is an interesting one. I I don't know that we can all fully self-insure, but there there are, there's a lot of research out there about the cost of unreimbursed health care for a 65 year old couple every year. Fidelity Investments does does a study and, and the number just keeps going up. It's well over um, $300,000, I believe, at this point. Uh, and this is the lifetime cost of health care unreimbursed for a, a 65 year old couple, which roughly works out to about six thousand dollars a year. How do you how do you figure out how much you actually need to save for your own health care um, as you uh, head toward and then into retirement? Well, so um, you have to save for maintaining your living standard. Uh, you have to save for maybe child needs. So you may want to help children uh, uh, make bequests or gifts, uh, grandchildren as well. Uh, so you need to do comprehensive financial planning uh, to, you know, I don't want to, <laughs> Let me just say that we have a, my company has this tool called Maxify.com, Maxify Planner, which, which does the uh, divorce issues as well. We, we actually retire the uh, divorce, separate divorce tool. So our main tool is actually Maxify.com. And uh, that will give you a plan and you would enter into the, our software, your special expenses for out-of-pocket costs. So the way to do that would be to, to err on the, on the high side to uh, put in more than you really expect to have to spend to, to deal with the risk. And then the, you know, that, and uh, so the software is gonna say, okay, here's how much you get to spend every year. Here's how much you need to save in addition to the 401k contributions. And now you'll be able to have a smooth living standard, but also meet these, these costs that are there in the future. So uh, that's what, you know, really I would say to anybody that, uh, uh, that we do have economics-based financial planning tools that actually can handle all this stuff at the same time. You can't do it piecemeal. You can't say, I'm gonna just you know, save so much for this, so much for that. You might be missing something. Uh, uh, you know, you might have be setting targets for your spending and retirement that are unrealistic. What you really wanna do is have the same, it's not just about retirement. You have these tools like, uh, you know, that are focused just on retirement. Well, you might be 45 or 55 and you want, you're not going to retire for a decade, you want, want to be able to have a living standard before then. So the whole goal of economics is to have a smooth ride, same living standard before and after retirement, basically. Paul is asking, how do you balance between self-insuring and general savings? Where's, where's the line there? Well, uh, you, there really isn't a, a line. There's a bottom line. There's uh, uh, the way you uh, deal with it is in our software is to say, here's the kind of upper end of what I, I'm going to have to pay for all these out of pocket expenses, uh, but also possible um, nursing home stays or home health care needs. And, you know, I'm going to put in a very conservative estimate and 
And then the tool is gonna to say, well, in addition to that, you can't spend everything left uh, right now because you won't have anything, that, you know, the tool is designed to make sure that you get to have the same living standard in the future as the present per person in the household. So, so it is gonna come up with the, your bottom line, which is, hey, here's how much you need to spend this year so you can do everything you need to do. Maintain your living standard, cover these costs if they arise. And if they don't arise, great, you'll have more to spend in the future. Well, and this is the sort of thing that a person could do with a financial advisor as well. If you've got a comprehensive financial advisor who's taking a look at your, your life, your goals, your spending, the amount of money that you expect to receive from Social Security, any pension income that's likely to come in, what your what your IRAs and other retirement accounts are likely to spill off. This is the kind of analysis that that you're suggesting everybody needs to do either on their own or with a planner before retirement. Yeah, I would just say that you know uh, economics based planning is a different methodology. Uh, Whereas conventional planning is kind of focused on what are your goals in retirement and trying to meet those goals independent of, you know, the, the fundamental goal, which is, you know, what you want to maintain your living standard. So uh, I, my goal for spending in retirement is a billion dollars a day. Uh, it's not feasible. So we need to have something that starts out with a realistic framework and certain, you know, I think that planners are kind of stuck in, in the, in the main with, software, which I wouldn't view as, you know, this is self-promoting, but um, I, uh, I have to tell you, since you asked me, um, uh, planners are starting with software, which I don't think is, you know, uh, necessarily uh, providing the best uh, framework for these decisions. Uh, and then they're forced to use their good common sense and adjust their recommendations. So planners, I think, are excellent people to go to because they've seen this and they you know can come up with a sensible plan even if they don't have the very best tools uh available to them and some some of these planners are forced to use particular tools by their bigger company that they're working for okay a couple a couple of additional questions have have come in first um a very specific one from thomas he says my understanding is that new york is one of four states in the country that do not require medical underwriting when purchasing a medicare supplement plan so one can start in new york with the medicare advantage plan and if unhappy switch back to traditional medicare and purchase a medicare supplement is this correct? Um, it, it seems to be, according to, to New York State, Thomas, that New York is one of the few states that allows enrollees to switch their supplement plan whenever they want. Uh, in most states, though, as Larry was saying, you do need to go through medical underwriting and answer health questions uh, before you're approved to switch to a new Medigap plan. But um, according to the New York State website, that is not how it works in the quote unquote empire state. Um, Marcel asks a question, Larry, is an HSA, a health savings account, the best place to save for health care costs long term? And is it correct to assume those funds can be used for expenses that Medicare doesn't cover? Yeah, um, well, taking the uh, second question first, which is uh, HSAs are just a fantastic uh, vehicle. Uh, once you go into Medicare, you can't actually use them, uh, just to be clear. Uh, the, you can't uh, save in them, but you can spend yeah. from them. Uh, you can't get the, uh, the deduction. You can you right the say you can't you can no longer I save see. in them but any money that you have accumulated already is yours to be spent down and you're not going to be taxed right as long as it's on health care so it's like tax free money it's like I, I get money in I put it into this thing I don't have to pay tax I earned it I don't have to pay taxes on it and then I spend it I don't have to pay taxes on when I spend it so it's much better than a 401k or an IRA where there I you know get the money in, don't have to pay taxes, put it in the account. But then when I take it out, I have to pay taxes. Here, when you take it out and spend it on healthcare, you don't have to pay taxes. So it's uh, the first thing everybody should grab, you know, should uh, participate in uh, for sure. But self-insurance, you know, it's not full, ins it's not full insurance. It's, uh, insuring, you know, trying to insure yourself against uh, a uh, 50 or 
$80,000 hip re replacement is very difficult, okay? And then the nursing care that you might uh, get. So your, our main line of defense here is getting into an insurance policy. And then, so we have no alternative but to try and kind of uh, evaluate the alternative risks, the alternative costs, and make a choice with the advice of um, people we really trust on this. The, the, the point about New York, I mean, if New York State, uh, I don't, I'm not a specialist in New York State's uh, uh, underwriting provisions, but I think it's terrific that they, they have what uh, you, you were just describing. I presume that New York State is coming in and saying to the uh, providers, you can't charge differentially based on pre-existing conditions if you want to operate in New York. So there must be, you know, each state has uh, a board of health and they can have their, you know, even during COVID, they, they could do things that the federal government, the FDA didn't want them to do. They could override the FDA. So that's uh, interesting. Um, so for example, Nebraska was doing things that the FDA wasn't approving for other states. Uh, they said, sorry, man, uh, or lady, uh, it's it's our, our right. So, uh, that's good. And, uh, you know, I would say one other thing, which is if you are facing a, a big risk of having to pay uh, or facing having to pay a very high supplemental and uh, Medigap premium, you could think about moving to New York, right? <laughs> you, you could that, that that moving is 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 expensive in and of itself especially with real estate prices these days uh janet's writing i work in healthcare and i have patients ask me about the best plans when it comes to medicare i don't work in health insurance but i tell patients to review plans based on their individual needs example conditions pharmacy needs should people choose a plan based on family medical histories yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a, a decent chance that you're. I think, yeah, there's a, there's a decent chance that you're um, going to live as long as your grandmother or grandfather. I think your longevity actually is con more connected from what I have been told by economists to your grandparents' lifespan than, than your parents' lifespan. Uh, so looking not just back at what happen to your parents, but to your grandparents is useful. Um, the, uh, and, uh, you know, so if you have a higher likelihood of getting uh, something that you're, you know, it's in the family, uh, it starts hitting around uh, 75, then yeah, you might want to make sure that the plan you're covering uh, incorporates that. And, and, you know, has, the, has you know, there's some drug plans that don't cover all the drug, don't provide this particular medication. And that medication may be critical for uh, the, the disease that your dad had. Well, I think that this is just why it's so important that these are not one and done decisions, that you revisit. Open enrollment is not just a date on the calendar. Open enrollment is a time when you should actually look at the choices that you have made in the past and try to make them better for the year to come based on any new information that has come your way. Formularies may change, right? The drugs that are covered by the particular plans may change. Your health may have changed. Your doctors may have changed networks. There are a lot of different moving pieces. And so with all of that in mind, can we, let's, let's take this conversation back to where we started. If you were sitting down with somebody, Larry, and, and they said, give me your three best pieces of advice. I, I'm, I'm going on Medicare. Give me your three best pieces of advice for getting this right this year. What would you say to them? I'd say if you live in California or some other state where there's a, a, a great HMO like Kaiser Permanente, uh, Medicare Advantage Part C may be the thing to do over I think something like half of new enrollees in the Medicare are choosing Medicare Advantage, but many don't live, you know, aren't having access, getting access to really excellent uh, uh, healthcare plans. They may feel quite healthy right now. They may be healthy. They may have it in their brain that their parents died at, at 80 and they're not going to make it beyond 80. So, 
they're kind of saying, I'm just going to ignore the future uh, or let the let my future safe self take care of the, themselves or himself or herself themselves. Uh, I'm going to uh, just worry about myself now and I want to save money. And uh, this this plan has got a great gym membership and I'm going to jump onto it. And that's uh, the, the wrong way to think about this. The right way is to spend probably three days of hard work and getting a broke broker. If you can afford it now, if you're middle class or rich, I would say uh, right off the bat that you should be thinking very carefully about, I would say my basic advice would be to go to traditional Medicare because of all the um, games that the private sector plans can play and do play and the experience rating, uh, uh, the, the cherry picking, go to the, take traditional Medicare and find a supplemental pay, plan that's covering, that's the best supplemental plan available, even if it's more expensive and treat that as an investment because they're likely to be around for a long time. So this might be Blue, Blue Cross Blue Shield. Uh, if, if you're living, for example, in Massachusetts, they, uh, that would probably be the best option if you could afford it. Uh, yeah. Um, Marcel is wondering, does she have to be in the same plans or options as her spouse? No, each person is free to choose their own plan. Okay. And, um, and finally, last question from Thomas, who's always wondered why we're not paying a premium for Part A hospital coverage when we turn 65. He understands the payroll tax that was paid during during working years, but what's the what's the balance there? You know, there's Congress through the years has set up all kinds of um, uh, provisions, ways to come up with more money, uh, whether they call it a Part B premium or a Part A premium. The Part B premium is also called the Irma premium. It's a progressive formula and it can get very high. And if you go and it's based on your modified adjusted gross income two years before uh, you have to pay it. So if you're 65, it's based on your MAGI, modified adjusted gross income when you're 63. And when you're 66, the, your premium is based on what you uh, what well, your income there was back when you were 64. So it's basically just a tax and it's called Part B. It could just as well be called Part A premium. It's just a tax. It has no connection to what you actually get. You just have to pay it. And uh, the uh, but you, and a couple other things we need to say, I think, in the context of the Part B premium, which is that uh, if you start taking Social Security, you're going to be automatically enrolled in Part A, but you don't have to enroll in Part B. So you could be working like I work for Boston University. Uh, I'm not taking, I'm taking Social Security, so I am automatically enrolled in Part A, but I'm getting coverage from Boston University, so I don't have to enroll in Part B. But if I were not employed and I was, I was taking Part A and I didn't sign up for Part B, then there's gonna be a penalty imposed on me. So the premium, I'm going to, the premium, the Irma bill is going to be higher for the rest of my life. If I wait, let's say five years until I start getting sick to join part B, well, they're going to let me join, but they're going to let, force me to pay a higher premium for the rest of my life. So we have to be very careful. Uh, if you're working for an employer with 20 or more employees, uh, you don't have to go into part B. If you're working for an employer with fewer than 20 employees, uh, there's a question if you if the employer is providing credible insurance and you can go and prove it to uh, to Medicare, then you don't have to start paying the Part B premium. But that's fraught with danger because these bureaucracies can decide. Oh, you know, some clerk in, in Medicare can say, I don't think that really qualifies for a credible plan. You haven't been paying premium for for ten years. You have to pay three thousand dollars more a year for the rest of your life. Uh, we, we have, uh, so I would, you know, recommend re reading Phil's book, uh, uh, get what yours for Medicare. Yes. If you're, yeah. I mean, that's, that's a very good, good Bible for this too. 
I think I think that's an excellent place uh, for everyone to start, um, and that's a good place for us to end. Uh, and so let me just say a big thank you to Phil for trying to be here. We're sorry about the technical difficulties, everyone. Thank you for sticking with us. Larry, always such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much. Great, great to be with you, really. Absolutely. And if you're looking for more information on this conversation in particular, um, please check out our website. It's protectedincome.org slash Kotlikoff dash Muller. And you'll find information on this particular conversation um, that you can take, take away and, and read um, at your leisure. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll see you next time.